Welcome everybody to this press briefing about the Anthropocene. My name is Annegret Bogert and I'm an editor for Medicine and Life Science here at the Science Media Center Germany. If you are not registered with any of the Science Media Center yet, check out the International Family of Science Media Centers and you might want to register with one of them. I also want to mention first that this press briefing is under embargo till next Tuesday, 11th of July, 7 p.m. Central European time. My colleague will post several embargo, also, uh, several time zone dates now in the chat. Um, so you can check out the embargo date for your time zone. Um, hopefully yours is among it um, to make sure that uh, you find the correct embargo date and that this press briefing stays under embargo to this day. Okay, um, the today press briefing is about the Anthropocene a term which is already commonly used, the time we are currently living in and where human life has such a drastic influence on Earth that it is shaping the planet's history irreversibly. However, the Anthropocene has not been ratified as an official epoch of Earth's history yet. Since 2009, a group of scientists, the Anthropocene Working Group, is collecting data to provide evidence that the Anthropocene is not just an idea, but an evidently proven phenomenon that can be defined by using stratigraphic methods. Next Tuesday, the Anthropocene Working Group will present a final step of their work by announcing a global boundary stratotype section and point um, that is also referred to as a golden spike. It's a reference point which defines the beginning of a geologic epoch. Today, two members of the Anthropocene Working Group are here with us. They are both geologists. It's Colin Waters, the chair of the group from the University of Lancaster in the UK, as well as Francine McCarthy from the Brooke University in Canada. Welcome you two and uh, good morning, Francine. Um, I would also like to welcome Jürgen Wren as a third expert in today's round. His research group focuses on the structure changing changes in system of knowledge and they founded the Anthropocene curriculum an initiative that brings together different scientific disciplines to explore pathways towards a novel transdisciplinary knowledge production. So I will start my briefing now uh, with a three opening question or with an opening question for each experts and then we can open the panel to your questions. Therefore, please post your question in the question and answer tool. My colleague will forward the question to me and I will raise them to the experts. So I would like to start with you, Colin. Um, could you please give us a short wrap up uh, what the Anthropocene Working Group has been researching on and what will happen next Tuesday at the Strati conference and what is to supposed to happen afterwards? Okay. Can I just make a, a slight correction to the introduction? It's the University yes. of Leicester, not Lancaster. So, Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, yes, so the, the announcement represents the, the combination of a three-year project to assess 12 sites as potential candidate global boundary stratotype section and point or GSSP, or as you say, a, a golden spike. The Anthropocene Working Group has no budget it's in order to seek formalization as a formal chronostratigraphic unit, any nominated golden spike section would need to be fully analyzed to assess the suitability of the section and its component anthropogenic markers. We needed to have more than one site analyzed as it was necessary to demonstrate the signals associated with the Anthropocene are present in sections across the planet and in diverse environments. In December 2018, the House de the House of World Cultures uh, based in Berlin, was able to secure funding that would allow the AWG and Hakeve to collaborate in the search for the Golden Spike. In 2019, we contacted research groups from around the planet, trying to encourage them to put forward their study areas as a potential Golden Spike and agreed budgets to help co-fund the studies. The studies formally started at the beginning of 2020, though some had been researching their sites uh, for other purposes for many years beforehand. Just as they started the project, the COVID pandemic paused their work. Some sites were unable to collect the planned core material and others couldn't access their laboratories to carry out the, the analyses for much of 2020. It's a testament to the dedication of the teams working on the 12 sites that by the autumn of 2022, they had completed their research and each had produced a peer reviewed paper detailing the evidence supporting their case as the Golden Spike section. These being published in a special volume of the Anthropocene Review, uh, this volume 10, part one, which is now available and, and free to download as well. 
These papers were then used to guide the voting members of the AWT in their decision as to which of the sites should be the GSSB section, as there could only be one. Three of the sites were deemed to be only suitable as reference sections, so that was San Francisco Bay, Ernesto K, and the Carlsbads in, in Vienna. So the remaining nine sites were then included in the vote. Now, ICS requirements are that each site needs to have a 60% supermajority to be approved. In the first round of voting, which ended on the 17th of December 2022, only four sites had received votes, uh, of which Crawford Lake received significantly more votes than the others, but well below the 60% supermajority. A second round of voting, which ended on the 20th of February 2023, considered the top three sites from the previous round. So that was Crawford Lake, Sihai Longguan Lake in China, and Beku Bay uh, from Japan. Again, Crawford Lake received the strongest support, but without achieving the supermajority. So in the third round of voting, uh, it was decided just to have the top two sites, so Crawford Lake and Sea Highland Guam. The results from the voting completed on the 19th of April saw Crawford achieve 60.9% of the vote, and so it was confirmed to be the AWG candidate to GSSB section. To celebrate the long collaboration between AWG, HACAVA and the Max Planck Institute and the conclusion of the study, we wish to hold an announcement of the result, this being originally planned for earlier this summer. However, Phil Gibbard, the Secretary General of the International Commission on Stratigraphy, asked that we delay this announcement so that it could be made at the fourth International Congress on Stratigraphy in Lille on Tuesday the 11th of July. There will be a short Anthropocene session in the late afternoon in which there will be four presentations from AWG members, including one that will announce the results to conference attendees. Some of those involved with the Anthropocene session will then transfer to a nearby hotel to hold a panel discussion that will be linked through to a conference being coordinated by the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, which commences at 7 p.m. Here, the results will be more widely announced and discussed. In the autumn, we aim to submit the final submission to the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy, SQS, which is our parent body. This submission will take three parts. It will require a detailed justification why the Anthropocene should be added to the International Chronostratigraphic Chart as a formal geological time unit at epoch rank and Crawfordian at age rank. We will then need to provide a full description of the proposed Crawford GSP site. This needs a final vote to confirm the precise level of the GSP in the core. The team had proposed 1950, which coincides with a distinct level in the core, and 1950s, the simplicity of the date itself linked to the Great Acceleration concept. However, previous discussions in the AWG had expressed a preference in linking the base of the Anthropocene to the abrupt increase in plutonium in the core. Existing data couldn't provide the date of this upturn to annual resolution, so the Crawford team are currently carrying out additional plutonium analyses to ensure annual resolution so that a decision can be made. And finally, in 2023, ICS agreed that there should be a formal process for all future submissions which, in which there's a standard auxiliary boundary stratotype. We should be selected and these should be used to support the GSSP site and allow the correlation of the boundary into other environments and parts of the world. These SABSs uh, need to make, meet the same criteria as a GSSP. So we're currently voting as to which of the eight remaining sites should be selected as SABSs, and the selected ones will also be written up in the proposal. Once the proposal is received by SQS, they will need to discuss the content, then vote on the three parts covered by the report. If there is a 60% or more support for the proposal, it will then go up to the ICS voting members, who again will discuss and vote. If they too vote with 60% supermajority, it will finally go up to IUGS for their decision as to whether it should be ratified. The process is expected to be completed in time for the International Geological Congress in Busan, Korea in August 2024. Thank you. All right, thank you, Colin, for this overview. Um, Francine, um, you have been analyzing the drilling core from the Crawford Lake. Um, which was now selected by the Anthropocene Working Group as the Golden Spike. Um, what does it tell us and why is it so um, important? Was, well, what makes it so special? Crawford Lake is so special because it allows us to see at annual resolution the changes in Earth history throughout two separate periods of human 
impact on this small lake. One was between the uh, late 13th and 15th centuries by Iroquoian language peoples, and much later, beginning in the early 19th century, the impact of European colonists. Within the sediments, within the, the varved sediments, the annually laminated sediments, there are a number of markers, what we call proxies, that are retained in the geologic record that will be retained there for, you know, many, many years to come that people can come back to and at annual resolution identify what was going on or, or reconstruct what was going on in the atmosphere, in the water, the hydrosphere, how that communicates itself to the sediments or the geosphere. And of course, a component of the geosphere, the sediments are the, the organisms and their remains that were in the water and that blew in from you know, outside like, like pollen grains, for instance. So it's the fact that in this lake in Canada, which is very deep, nearly 24 meters, quite small, 2.4 hectares, that physiography, that shape, restricts the uh, mixing of the water columns so that the bottom waters do not mix with the surface waters. The bottom of the lake is completely isolated from the rest of the planet except for what gently sinks to the bottom and accumulates as sediment. And this very small deep lake is a sinkhole, so it's a, a caved in cave, in the Silurian rocks of the Niagara Escarpment in Canada. So they're limestone rocks, and there was a cave that had been dissolved in the, in the rocks, the roof caved in, so the, the water fills this lake. And in this lake, there obviously is a lot of uh, weathered uh, calcium and carbonate from the rocks. And when the water gets warm enough, the calcium and carbonate ions join together in they precipitate, they crystallize into little crystals of calcite that snow down, that rain down, that falls slowly through the water column, and they form each summer a white layer. And it is that white layer that we can count and we can identify exactly which year we're looking at. In Crawford Lake, the um because there is a strong climatic control on how much calcite is produced every year, uh, it, it, it's quite distinct, the pattern that we see, like, like fingerprints. So it's, it's not just um, counting one, two, three, four, five. Each layer has a very unique appearance. So for instance, the thickest layer of the 20th century is 1935. That's a very easy one to pick out. 1956, 57, 58 form a, a very clear triplet. So there are some very distinctive varves that we can correlate very easily across these, the small basin so that we're confident that we have annual resolution. And amongst the annually resolved things that we've studied as part of our team and that HECAV uh, very generously supported the analyses of key markers independently and in other labs, not just by my own uh, colleagues, to assess whether we could, we could detect the impact of the great acceleration, which was number one, and number two, whether chronologically, in addition to having this annual precision, chronologically, whether we could see the effects of the Cold War, because the AWG had voted in you know group discussion we had decided to use the plutonium 239 that falls out from the atmosphere from above ground nuclear testing as the main marker so it is the great acceleration as colin indicated that we decided to use as a major tipping point in earth history but it is that increase in plutonium and all radioactive fallout actually but plutonium 239 specifically that we chose as the marker and fortunately for us the tests done in independent labs confirm that each of these things like dominoes uh, 
changes very, very quickly right around 1950. So I think that's why the Anthropocene Working Group chose our site in the end. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Jung now as a third uh, expert um, to give us an overview. Like, what is the motivation of the Anthropocene Working Group to collect all this evidence uh, in order to call a new epoch? And what are the implications? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would really like to contextualize this discussion a little bit. The Anthropocene concept uh, has been popularized in the year 2000 by the uh, chemist, Nobel Prize winning chemist, Paul Crutzen. Uh, and he was at a conference and, and had the impression, uh, you know, the earth has been so dramatically changed by human intervention on a planetary scale that it's no longer legitimate to use the, uh, the traditional current term for the uh, Earth epoch that, that was used broadly or is still used broadly, namely the Holocene. And he said, you know, we cannot say with all these changes that we are living still in the Holocene, we are living, and then he was searching for a term and he came up spontaneously with the term Anthropocene. Now, Paul Kutzen was, as I said, a chemist. He was the one who figured out uh, what causes the ozone hole that got him the Nobel Prize. Uh, but he was an earth system science as well, but he was not a geologist. Now, when he announced the Anthropocene at this conference, the, the reaction was worldwide very intense. And the Anthropocene concept uh, became uh, an, uh, an, an, a media attention and, a, and, a, and, a, and an interdisciplinary concept because it pointed to these global impacts of humanity in their connectivity, you know, it's not just about climate change, it's not just biodiversity loss, it's not just the sediments that humans are moving, it's all of this together. So, and this for an earth system science is of course, uh, you know, a remarkable fact that we are not looking at just one, you know, physical or chemical phenomenon, we are looking at a lot of interrelated phenomena. Now, this has you know, launched uh, a worldwide uh, discussion. The concept has been used also in the social sciences and in the humanities, who has caused, who is responsible for these global changes. And so there was a very intense discussion starting in the year 2000. Now, as we just heard, the Anthropocene Working Group was founded only nine years later in 2009 and started its work. Why the delay and why is this so different? Uh, because we heard about you know, uh, precise measurements now, uh, a, a precise location, and so on. Now, as I said, the Anthropocene is a truly multidisciplinary uh, concept. And uh, the scale, the, the, the time scale of, uh, of Earth history is in the responsibility of the geologist. Now, the geologists have uh, their own very careful uh, and, and very well-proven uh, methods, and they were then called to verify if from their perspective, in particular from a stratigraphic perspective, the Anthropocene can really be uh, labeled as a new Earth epoch, which is not the same as, you know, the perspective from the Earth system science. Uh, so the geologists are also not responsible for finding out, you know, the, the causes, neither the natural causes, the dynamics of the Earth system, nor the social causes of the Anthropocene. Their mission is really to anchor this discord of the Anthropocene, this broad discourse, in the very precise uh, discipline of, uh, uh, of stratigraphy. And they are talking within a well-established system. Now, the one problem is, of course, that that well-established system of geology normally works with earth periods that uh, you know had, had started thousands or even million years ago. So now the Anthropocene, as we just heard, is, is now being proposed to be dated to the middle of the 20th century. Now, the geology discipline had hands to adapt their methods to this you know, new challenge to, to do uh, what has been called a geology of the present. That's very, very unusual. And hence the Anthropocene Working Group was composed not only of uh, professional geologists. We have just heard two, you know, highly prominent professional geologists, but there are also, for instance, historians uh, uh, who are members. And uh, the Anthropocene Working Group has looked at this Anthropocene phenomenon itself from an interdisciplinary perspective, but trying to anchor this in their precise 
terminology. And we are approaching now this, this anchoring in a very serious way. And I think there are, there are three, con there are, there are three uh, consequences. One is, uh, as I said, it makes the, uh, the concept very precise. Uh, it's uh, a challenge, a challenging object for geology. It has to adapt, had to adapt uh, its method, you know, plutonium signals, uh, plastic, uh, microplastic sediments. This is all completely new, also methodologically. And third, it creates a bridge between the natural sciences and the humanities because it's about the humans, about the anthropos that has had an impact here. So social science, history, archaeology, all of these disciplines from you know, a humanity side are also involved in understanding this process. And I, I realize that the question of why this is the middle of the 20th century uh, may, may raise in your minds. And, uh, you know, and, and the answer has been given to you already, as a matter of fact, because it's for these very specific stratigraphic reasons. But let me add just one remark and then I close. Uh, this is not about the cause of the Anthropocene. So, you know, Paul Crutzen in 2000, you know, anchored the Anthropocene concept in the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. That's very plausible there, you know, the use of fossil energy started on a big scale. But this is not the question here. The question is, how can we, you know, determine on the basis of sediments of, uh, of, of stratigraphy, the beginning of the Anthropocene in the terminology, in the conceptual framework of geology and of stratigraphy in, in particular. But the Anthropocene research is, uh, is going on because it involves all these other disciplines. And the uh, HKW, the Haus der Kulturen der Welt, has, has together with uh, the Institute, Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, done a great deal of enlarging and broadening this interdisciplinary discourse. And now my real last remark is the Max Planck Society has, as a consequence of these discussions, founded a new institute dedicated to the study of this interdisciplinary phenomenon of the Anthropocene. I'm now talking to you from this institute in Jena, and it's called the Max Planck Institute for Geoanthropology, uh, or of geoanthropology in order to, you know, draw attention to this interaction of the Earth system on, and of the human global society. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ren. Um, I, you, you gave me a bridge to the first question already, um, like the start of the Anthropocene and um, why did the working group chose the Great Acceleration as a start and not, for example, the industrial area? So making it sharp, like what is, are the real characteristics why you choose this point or the starting point? Maybe friend, Colin or Francine? Yeah, Sh shall I start with that one? Um, it, it's a good point because obviously when we started this analysis, we were guided by Paul Crutzen's original thoughts and, and he was very much uh, of the attitude as an atmospheric chemist that the, the start of the Anthropocene should link to the start of the Industrial Revolution. So maybe towards the latter part of the, the, 18, uh, the 1700s, so about 1780, uh, he even suggested linking it to the invention of what steam engine. Uh, but that's a, a very historical conceptual thing for us to try and find the evidence of what steam engine in a geological succession you just can't find the the effects of that despite there's a clear cause what we had to do was look at the um, sedimentary successions the archives that we can read um, and see where we start to see significant change in happening if you're based in northern europe if you're based in the uk yes you do see the first evidence of the industrial revolution happening uh, early in the 1800s. Um, but if you're based in large parts of Asia, or Australasia, Southern Hemisphere, um, there is just no effect. The sediments just do not show any significant uh, effect from the Industrial Revolution. So um, the more we looked into this, and it was not until probably about 2014 that we actually came to this conclusion, that really the point on the, uh, the, across the planet where you start to see a synchronous change is in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and the advantage there, as well as the, the indicators of, of the effects of things like increased burning of fossil fuels, uh, changes to agricultural practices, um, increased, increased uh, industrialization, increased globalization of the planet and, and transfer of species across the planet um, as part of that process. All of these things link to this concept of the great acceleration that Will Stefan had proposed um, earlier on in the in the 2000s. Um, so there was a clear linkage of the cause 
to an effect in the sedimentary successions, which was synchronous across the planet. And that's what we look for. We want to have a, a geological time interval with a very prominent boundary that's synchronous across the planet. And the great advantage with this one as well is that because of the, um, the above ground nuclear detonations, the testing that went on in the 1950s, there's a very precise um, geochemical boundary that is present across the planet, across all environments that links to the onset of those detonations. And so that again ties into the 1950s. Yeah. Um, does tying the advent of the Anthropocene to plutonium mean tying it to the development of large-scale testing of nuclear weapons? No, actually, it's just, it's just a very um, useful synchronous marker. I mean, the key thing here is if, if, um, if, the, if the only thing that we had was the detonations of nuclear weapons and there was no other change, there would be no need for the Anthropocene. It's just a very practical tool for us to use to recognize if you can look at a, a section in detail, analyze it for plutonium, radiocarbon, iodine isotopes, what you'll see uh, routinely is a very sudden increase in their, their content within these sedimentary successions. As soon as you have that, you know you've appeared into the 1950s in that succession. So it's a very clear marker. But the principal thing here is that the, you have all these other markers reflecting the, the big changes to the planet that happened during the Great Acceleration. So this increased in consumption of fossil fuels, um, the use, greater use of uh, nitrogen fertilizers, um, the sort of uh, increased trade globally that's spreading species across the planet and homogenizing the, the biota of the planet. All of these things change very rapidly about that point. That's the critical thing about the Anthropocene. The, the presence of the plutonium market is just a very useful tool to allow you to define that boundary. And of course, since the 1960s, that signal has in effect been reduced because of the, the limited test ban treaty. There's no longer these above ground destinations. So there's no more plutonium being added um, to the atmosphere because of those destinations. Yes, so the plutonium coming from um, uh, nuclear fuel pro processing plants. So there still is plutonium in the environment, but the signal is very much more reduced. So it's just a very short interval of time that represents a clear boundary that we can use. Yeah, the next question probably goes to Francine. Um, are there any difference in the choice for the Anthropocene GSSP in comparison to choices of other GSSPs to other epochs and geological times? Uh, I think both Jorgen and Colin touched on that a little bit in their initial statements because by making the decision to define the Anthropocene using a GSSP in the stratigraphic sense, there are very clearly defined rules around GSSPs, but they're mostly, they have been designed for cliffs of rocks with fossils in them, you know, they, so when the stratigraphic column, when you get more recent up the stratigraphic column, you get to the point that Cliffs of rock are not necessarily the best places to look, but most of the quaternary is actually based not on cliffs of rock, but on ice cores and even a stalactite. Uh, so we're looking at, by determining that the place in the recent Earth record where the, the effects of humans overwhelm the Earth system, so the interrelated intertwined systems of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, the geosphere, the biosphere, etc. that that with the effects of the great acceleration, when when the Anthropocene Working Group decided to do that, it had to look for not glyphs of rock, but for other uh, geological environments. So that included things like living corals, for instance, there were two sites that had living corals, very uh, unusual. Uh, to to use these kinds of environments, a peat bog, for instance. So environments that are not traditionally geologic, uh, stratigraphic environments. So, so so we did made every effort to adhere to the rules, uh, and I'm not aware that we didn't adhere to them. But it, it requires a, a little bit of a a shift in perspective to look at. Varve lakes, for instance, and apply the rules that have existed for a long time now that define a GSSP. 
Yeah. Um, I will stay a bit uh, on the geological questions so far and come for the further implications a bit later. I will split this a bit. So, um, uh, yeah, um, for Francine, do you have any update on the new plutonium analysis? Are there results back yet on where the plutonium is in the various layers? Not yet, but um, we're promised that we'll have something uh, for the 11th. And it's a novel collaboration between the lab at uh, Southampton that uh, measures activity and an, a lab in Vienna that is actually going to use accelerated mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry. So uh, when they give us these results, they're focusing right now on the late 1940s through mid 1950s. So just eight or 10 years, I think they're focusing on for the 11th. The reason for that, as Colin um, mentioned earlier, we're, we chose Team Crawford 1950 for reasons that we feel are compelling. Uh, in our core, it is near a, the base of a, a very clear color change. So stratigraphically, it works for our core, but more broadly and more philosophically, 1950 is the cutoff date for radiocarbon dates for present. So before present refers to before 1950. So the present we would consider as the Anthropocene since 1950. Before then, we would call the Holocene. And so when you hear reports of radiocarbon ages as before present, the reason that they use 1950 as the cutoff is that since then, all of that above ground nuclear radioactivity has created so much artificial radiocarbon that the time clock from radiocarbon analysis doesn't, doesn't work. So back to your question. I'm, I'm expecting to be able to present data from those eight or 10 years on the 11th. So at the press conference, um, I may be able to show those, if, assuming we have them. But based on analyses from two previous cores uh, from Crawford Lake, cores collected in 2019 and in 2022, the rapid increase is between 1950 and 1953. So as Colin says, when we have those annually resolved 1951 and 52 and 53, as well as 1950, the Anthropocene Working Group will look at those data, revisit that discussion of should the base the lower boundary be at the most rapid inflection point? Is that going to be 52 or 53? Or do we leave it at 1950? And that's something uh, that we will be discussing and making a decision on before writing up the, the proposal for the subcommission on Quaternity to consider, because the point in the Crawford Lake core, exactly what depth is going to be determined by that. There's also um, a question about other markers. Um, so what role will the other discussed markers like microplastic, black carbon particles or others play in the future? What other markers are present at Crawford Lake? I think the presence of secondary markers is important because the ability to detect the activity of radionuclides decreases through time uh, with um, decay. So we're not looking at centuries, we're looking at millennia, but nonetheless, if we're assuming that there will be individuals looking at the geologic record in millennia to come, it's it's important that things like the spheroidal carbonaceous particles or fly ash the, the, um, that are produced by very high temperature combustion of fossil fuels, primarily coal, and um, primarily in, in uh, industrial applications like steel mills, we have a very, very clear increase, dramatic increase in the concentration of these little carbonaceous particles in our core at exactly the same depth that we see that rapid rise in plutonium. We also see a distinct change in uh, nitrogen isotopes. And as Colin mentioned, in addition to the combustion of uh, large amounts of fossil fuels, that led to this great acceleration. We also see uh, nitrogen fertilizers, so the, the you know technique to grab nitrogen out of the atmosphere and and uh, use it as fertilizer. 
that has affected the isotopic composition of, of the atmosphere. And we see that very clearly in Crawford Lake, again, at the same place in our core that we have all of these other markers. So there is a very synchronous signal across secondary markers and the primary marker at Crawford Lake. And we can correlate those across our basin in our multiple cores. And we can correlate that with cores and with not just cores, but uh, with other geological environments like, uh, you know, in living corals even. So that these are, um, the, the record at Crawford Lake is representative of the changes that make the time since the mid 20th century geologically different from before and then worthy of, we think, a golden spike. Maybe uh, one last question to the Crawford Lake as uh, and the selection as the spot as a golden spike. Like, what does it make with the lake? Um, does it now need special uh, protection? And uh, all over, what would it make with the place if it was selected or if it's not selected? Yeah, so I um, mean, Crawford Lake is now the candidate being proposed to the Subcommission on Quaternary and then hopefully up the line hopefully by uh, next uh, summer to be the Golden Spike. So for the conservation authority that has managed the site since 1969, this um, poses, it, it's, it's exciting, but it also poses some um, concerns about management so that they've been in communication with us for a while now, what will this mean in terms of increased visitorship, in terms of they are now, of course, committed to uh, changing the signage and, and uh, some of the messaging in the lake to update the, the recent findings from the geology and the hydrology that, that Team Crawford has come up with, but also to communicate the importance of the Anthropocene as a concept. So irrespective of the, the ultimate decision of the subcommission on quaternary and, and so on, this is going to be a place where discussions about human impact on the planet to the point that a tipping point was reached can be had. So there, there is currently an interpretive center, um, reconstructed longhouses, et cetera, and interpreted boardwalk around the lake. Those are going to be upgraded which is of course going to cost them money. But in terms of security, um, there's no reason to suppose that there will be, you know, an, a, a need for added security. There is some security because it is a protected conservation area. Um, there will be on the signage, it will make it very clear that even if we are awarded a golden spike designation, that little brass plaque will not be at the bottom of our 24 meter deep lake so that people don't dive to try to find it and steal it as a memento. It will, you know, it would be in the museum in Ottawa in a cryogenic facility. So if they, and that would be very difficult to break into, that has a lot of security. Uh, so that's not going to be easily stolen like some of the plaques have been. So in terms of visitorship, it is, it is a very well visited site. They are very well equipped to communicate through their park interpreters with everything, everyone from school children to you know senior citizens who are interested in in uh, all aspects from the indigenous culture to the natural history. This Anthropocene question is uh, going to be just one more layer, and and for a short while, it'll probably cause a big uptick like it has in my life in terms of media requests, but then it'll die back down and hopefully uh, it will just be a, a very calm and beautiful sight to encapsulate what is maybe not as beautiful a change to the earth that well, people can easily visit. Yeah. I thought the next question. Um, it says, we currently live in the Megalian age of the Holocene epoch. If we adopt a new epoch, will a working group have to start work on a new age, or can this age only be recognized after the fact? Just to confirm what I mentioned in the presentation I gave, um, it, it's a joint thing here that when you define the base of the Anthropocene, you're also, which is an epoch level, you're also defining the base of the Crawfordian, which would be the age. 
So they're synonymous. It's the same point. Okay. And there could be a uh, thumbs up for a Crawfordian age, but not for the higher level, which would be the Anthropocene epoch. So, I mean, that th there are two questions that the subcommission on quaternary and the other bodies are going to be uh, evaluating. First of all, is the geological evidence sufficient for any golden spike at all? And does it rise to the level of the epoch as opposed to a fourth age of the Holocene, for instance? Jürgen, what does the addition of the Anthropocene to the stratigraphic chart mean to science? Can you oversee this already? No, of course I cannot oversee it uh, because uh, the Anthropocene concept already has had major implications uh, for scientific developments. And now that this is sort of made so precise and anchored so well in the in the stratigraphic record, it will uh, certainly boost uh, the discussion about the Anthropocene concept. You know, in the humanities, people have talked about you know other labels you know for this major impact of humanity on the planet, like the Capitalocene. And uh, I think it will help, as I said also in, in the beginning. To, to, to consolidate the bridge between the humanities and the natural science. That is at least a development for which I hope, because the Anthropocene concept has now received you know, a firm anchoring and a very precise stratigraphic definition. And it makes sense now for the other sciences to take this as a reference point for their discussions. And as we are looking at uh, something you know, that is shaping our our fate as humanity and in which uh, a situation in which we have to act uh, as humanity, if I may say so, then it's very important to have a common reference point. So the Anthropocene you know, strengthens this, I would hope at least, global awareness, not just among the sciences, but also you know, political and economical uh, awareness as well for the situation in which we are, which is, you know, uh, we have a label for it, or we will have a label for it now probably, but understanding is, is, is another matter and uh, understanding precisely which actions we have to uh, take in a highly nonlinear complex system is another challenge. Of course, we know some actions we need to take. We need to get out of the fossil energy in order you know, to, uh, uh, to mitigate climate change. But there are so many other implications of the Anthropocene concept, and that will uh, remain a huge challenge for science, for science, politics, and economy, I would say, and society. Yeah, um, there's another question that uh, is asking, like, how do you know that humans will not continue to influence the sediments in the centuries to come? Isn't it too early to call this, or does not does it matter if there are new markers by humans maybe come up, or can you already call the epoch now and it won't change if there are more markers or more yeah, evidence is added? I think that's a question to the geologist. Yeah, I, I would say almost certainly, though, though geology is dealing with the past record, we're not looking at trying to estimate what's happening in the future. Um, almost certainly humans will be changing the types of markers they're generating. You know, As we move away from the fossil fuel systems that we live by at present, whatever we move to, whether it be lithium batteries or, or whatever sources of energy we get in the future, there will be some market associated with that. And there's 8 billion people all having an impact on the planet. There's bound to be a repercussion. Um, the, the, the question is, I suppose, do you feel that, that you can possibly return to Holocene state on the planet? And, and I think the answer is definitely no, not, not partly because you know, the, the huge amounts of fossil fuel combustion has caused greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, which will take thousands of years to return back to what might be considered to a Holocene level. Uh, it's already been estimated that the, the next ice age has been delayed by at least 50,000 years, if not 100,000 years. So that's something that's you know, five to 10 times longer than the existence of the Holocene uh, as, a, as an epoch. Um, but clearly uh, the biology of the planet has changed irrevocably. We cannot go back to a Holocene state now. We can't take all of these species that have been transported across the planet, whether on purpose or by accident, and return them back to where they came from. So we are going to have a homogenized and, to, to a large degree, um, a depopulated um, biota on the planet, on the planet in the future. And uh, so that's very much a core characteristic of the Anthropocene 
and that that I doubt is going to change. So you know, the, there's a clear issue of at present we've had 70 years of the Anthropocene. That has been long enough because of the rapidity of the change, the preciseness of it, to recognize that we've moved into this new earth state and that should be defined by a, a new geological epoch. Um, where it goes into the future will be you know, potentially a continuation of that story. Mm. May, I, may I add to this just a brief remark, because uh, just to emphasize what Colin has just said, you know, it's not that we steer the Earth system in such a way that if tomorrow, you know, we stop uh, using fossil energy and emitting greenhouse gases, we can change the course of the planet. Uh, there are so many changes uh, that have been committed already, you know, the, the, the glaciers uh, melting, you know, the, the entire uh, uh, creosphere, the ice on the Earth, you know, these changes that we have induced already will only unfold in the next decades and, and, and uh, centuries. And uh, there is no way that we, can, that we can stop this for the time being. Um, and, and changes will continue to happen. And uh, the new intervals of geologic time are always established on the basis of the evidence at that moment in time. That's why there is a very specific point, the GSSP, there, so, so when, for instance, uh, there was the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, even after th things became extinct, but it was that particular extinction event due to the iridium, et cetera, it's, yeah, due to the impact that is marked by the iridium, that will never change. So yes, more things happened since the Cretaceous mass extinction event. That's why we, we still live in the Cenozoic era but nothing of that magnitude has yet happened. But things will continue to happen in the future, but we can only concern ourselves with recognizing that as Paul Crutzen uh, hypothesized in 2000, we're no longer living in a Holocene world. So to continue to refer to the planet as being in the Holocene is not accepting reality. Yeah, another... Um question I would like to ask is uh, what are the impacts on nature, climate, health of the Anthropocene now um, at a time when we only talk about climate change or are the impacts of both phenomena, so the impact of humans and the climate change kind of combined or related? Yeah, can I uh, react to this? I mean, we are not just talking about climate change. Climate change is a is a great challenge and it's an important one. But we're also talking about biodiversity loss, for instance. And uh, in the Anthropocene makes it clear how these things are uh, uh, related to each other. Let me take the issue of, of health. You know, we, we are just coming out uh, of the pandemia, of the corona pandemia. You know, for all we know, you know, uh, research is still underway on the exact, uh, you know, origin of the pandemia. But in 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 in, a, in with high probability, it's a zoonosis. It's uh, it's it's been a virus that comes from an animal and has gone over to humans. Now, we know from uh, statistics that the uh, the number of zoonoses of such diseases that have sprung over from from animals to humans has has increased in the last decades, uh, substantially increased. And this is partly because of human land uh, use. The, the areas available to wildlife or to wildlife has have shrunk. The likelihood of uh, encounters between domestic, domesticated animals and wild animals uh, have increased. And uh, so that likelihood uh, is, uh, has, has increased as well. Now, uh, climate change is, of course, affecting our health already simply by extreme weather events. Uh, and, uh, and it also has many other impacts on, uh, for instance, coastal sites with sea level rise and so on. So all of these things are, are very, very closely intertwined. And that's really the one lesson that we should take away from the Anthropocene concept. We cannot slice these effects uh, into separate areas. We have to address them as a, as, a, as a phenomenon that is multiply connected. And we have to make an effort to understand it and adapt our, our societies accordingly. Jürgen, maybe another quite abstract question. Do you see the concept of the Anthropocene showing more the power of humanity or more the hybrid of humanity? Well, one has to think for a moment what an answer to this question would imply. Uh, 
you know, the answer, if I say it's just a hybris, and of course it's partly a hybris because, you know, we uh, have, uh, the Anthropocene is a consequence of many, is of an unintended consequences, for instance, of our use of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, but if we just say it's a hybris, we basically, you know, have to be fatalist and have to give up, give up on changing. So I also think it's an indication of the power of humans uh, because we need that power, our knowledge, our technologies, but also our our capacities of of making better, better societies in order to prevent, to mitigate uh, the worst consequences and to adapt to, to what we cannot change. And therefore we need all our intelligence, all our ingenuity and uh, all our empathy for, you know, because we, we cannot solve this as a local problem, it's a global problem. So we have to understand, you know, how, how others may suffer from it. And so I think, you know, we have to take it as a challenge also for, you know, human creativity and, uh, and ingenuity. If I can jump in there, I think I can think of one other species that has affected the planet more. And those are the cyanobacteria who back two billion years ago oxygenated the atmosphere. The cyanobacteria did not have the ability to think it through, recognize what they were doing and consider the consequences, but we do. So when we talk about hubris and, and humans, yes, we have had a massive impact and we will continue. Eight billion humans, you know, particularly expecting a, a, a certain lifestyle, a standard of living, will inevitably impact the planet in the future. But we also can mitigate those impacts. We've learned lessons from the past, the environmental movements and technological fixes and so on are possible. So, so it's not a question without hope, as, as Jorgen says, there is hope for the future and that hope lies as much in humanity as it does in science. Francine, if you will, there is one big difference between us, another big difference between us and the uh, cyanobacteria, if I understand it correctly, because I'm not a geologist, is that the changes that we have induced uh, were much more rapid than the changes in, in previous yeah. geological transition. Yeah. So we do have to cope with a factor of time. Yeah, and I think it's critical here to consider that, you know, one of the, the, I suppose you can say the positive messages here is that when we talk about an Anthropocene that starts in the 1950s, it represents a very rapid change that we have caused to the planet. There was nothing inevitable about this, even a century ago, that we would move into this new epoch. Uh, so it shows that, that the combined impact of humanity can be changed rapidly for the good and for the bad. So, you know, there, there's hope in that respect. It's not inevitable that we have to slide into continuing uh, pov poverty of environment. Yeah, what are the political consequences of declaring a new epoch? It's hard, hard to foresee. I mean, there are some politicians that have already taken up the concept and have taken it as, uh, you know, an indication that, uh, uh, that things are, uh, are challenging and that one needs to think, you know, systemically, as I keep emphasizing that one has to take into account, you know, that, you know, you cannot just solve the energy problem without thinking that if you use, you know, uh, uh, bioenergy, you may impact, you may have an impact on, uh, on agriculture because you're using the same surfaces for, you know, producing fuel that you would have need for farming. So this kind of connectivity, I think it's a very, very important message for politicians. And uh, I can only hope that politicians will, 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 will hear that uh, message. It's not just a specialized methods for, you know, uh, for fans of uh, geological time epochs. It really, it, it should be a, an, a, a wake up call for politicians that, you know, we, we see it currently also in Germany, you know, there are political measures, also well meant political measures, but then they have economic consequences that nobody has thought about. They don't scale up to a European or a global level. So think systemically and think globally. And I think that that would be an implications for politics. Yeah, thank you. Um... I will still come uh, anyhow come back to more precise questions that I would, would like to quickly answer before we have to close already in some minutes. Um, Mary Francine, you can uh, answer this quickly. Has the Anthropocene Working Group engaged with indigenous people around Crawford Lake for consent to this proposal? We've engaged with the indigenous people 
for consent to uh, core the lake, for consent to, for permission to do field work on the lake, because for Indigenous people, the natural world has personhood. And so in order to uh, continue our field work for geologic purposes, we endeavored to do that in the most respectful way possible. And uh, so, yes, so in order to get permission, we certainly did that. And that interaction has enriched both uh, the, the scientists and Team Crawford. And I think it has, I speak for the Indigenous people, certainly Catherine Tamaro, who's an artist and an elder, a Wyandotte elder, it has in, influenced her artistic practice. And so certainly that dialogue will continue into the future and they will have a voice in the new um, signage and uh, description of materials at the Crawford Lake Conservation Area in including not just the scientific changes that have occurred, but also bringing that uh, cultural perspective of the Indigenous people as well. Yeah. Uh, another question about the candidates. Uh, which side was placed second? Beppu Bay or Si Hai Long Wang? <laughs> and, um, si Hai Long Wang. Okay, and what was the advantage of Crawford Lake over the other? They, they were actually very, very difficult to choose between, actually. And I think this is why we ended up going to, to three rounds of voting. Um, and of course, individual voting members would have their own justifications of why they preferred Crawford. Um, I think in many cases, the, the, one of the issues was that Crawford had some of the traditional aspects of looking at the paleontology, looking at the fossils, so the biological, biological changes that happen with time, uh, which Si Halongwan didn't do. Um, the, the, traditionally, geologists tend to subdivide their, their epochs uh, and ages using uh, fossil uh, markers, the first appearances of particular sp species of fossils. Uh, and you can see biological changes happening very rapidly at Crawford Lake, things like the, the Dutch elm disease causing elm pollen to, to disappear very rapidly in the lake around about the 1950s is a very clear marker and, and one that's sort of regional over the Northern Hemisphere. Um, that sort of signal was missing from Si Ha Long Wan. It, it would probably be there, but um, it hasn't been looked at. And I think the other thing was that, um, as Francine mentioned, that there is a clear pre-1950 human influence in the area. So it's not to say that the Anthropocene represents the start of human impact. It's not at all, because there's been that record going back hundreds of years. Whereas the Si Ha Long Wan site is, is very remote. It's out towards the Korean border. Um, and, and it's very much an appearance of first human impact in the region is coming in the 1950s. So it's a very clear change from a sort of Holocene succession to an Anthropocene one, but it's perhaps a bit artificial in that it doesn't have that earlier human impact you'd expect. Mm. For the um, further process of the um, of the voting, um, their question: Are the upcoming voters uh, votings are more formal approvings, or will there be further discussions? And on what ground could the ICS, for example, reject the application of the Anthropocene Working Group? So, so yeah, so clearly our, our additional voting, which is to first of all decide on the SABSs, which are these auxiliary sites, that will be done formally. Uh, as will the final approval of the level uh, of the GSSP at the Crawford Lake site. So they're the two things that we deal with still. With regard to the submission that goes to SQS and ICS and eventually IUGS as well, um, they're, they're obviously a formal vote uh, and it has the same process that we followed of uh, a period of discussion amongst the voting members and then they have 30 days to then cast their vote. And uh, certainly there is um, uh, no guarantee with regard to the whole process because, it, because it's a 60% supermajority have to support each round. That does make it that it has to be a very strong proposal for it to get through those three levels of voting. It's a very conservative process you know, and, and probably there's good reason for that because you don't want to establish the formalization of the units if it's not grounded on very strong evidence. 
And what could be reasons for rejections? Is it like the evidence or they maybe don't like the Crawford side or is it solely because they don't like the idea of the Anthropocene or what what could be reasons for rejections? All of those, yeah. I mean, they, they have to vote on, it's slightly unusual in that normally um, by this stage already, um, the uh, chronostratigraphical chart will have the particular unit shown on it. So things like the Holocene had been decided that this would exist as a, a chronostratigraphical unit long before they defined the GSSP for it. So really what they had to do was just define the site and define where the boundary was, and what the mark was that defined that base. In our case, not only do we have to do that, demonstrate that Crawford is you know, a very good candidate, um, also, we're now being asked to formalize these auxiliary sites, which haven't been done in the past. In the past, you just did it as a, an informal, we recommend these sites represent good sites. Well, now we have to formalize that. And again, that's going to be voted on by the SQS. So they could reject it because they don't like the auxiliary sites. They may be happy with the, the, the Crawford site, but not the auxiliaries. So we've got to be careful in our selection of which ones are suitable. But then they could also just say, well, at the end of the day, um, we, we are not impressed with the evidence you've provided to demonstrate the Anthropocene is justifiably a new epoch of geological time. So as Francine said, that they may support the idea that there's a stage here and the Crawford site represents a new stage of the Holocene, but they're not prepared to accept that the Anthropocene is a significant change uh, beyond the, the envelope of change that you see within the Holocene. Maybe as a last really final question to all three of you, like uh, if you could say this in like one sentence, what is for you like um, the, mo the, the most important evidence and the biggest argument to call the Anthropocene? Maybe, uh, yeah, I start with you, Francine. Would you like to start? There is evidence at all of the 12 sites that we studied as a group, and certainly the nine sites that, that went forward into that Anthropocene Review um, publication that is, uh, is uh, open to everyone to read. So I, wel I welcome, I urge everyone to read uh, all of that evidence if you want to wade through all the science, but there is evidence globally of a massive shift, a tipping point in the Earth system that is compelling. Thank you. Colin. Uh, it's a good point that you know, we looked at uh, eight very different environments uh, across five different continents. And when you put the 12 sites together, there is a, an incredible amount of consistency between them, which is something that we couldn't have anticipated when we started doing this work. So it really endorses as, as a group, all of the 12 sites, it's a shame because we have to pick one site to be the GSSP, but actually the strength in the argument is the basis of the 12 sites together when you combine them and read the story that they tell you, it shows you that there is this very significant, a very rapid change to the environment in a, in a very short period of time. And that's the 1950s. And I would add exactly this, that, uh, you know, we are looking at a system, at an Earth system uh, that is rapidly changing. And those changes can no longer be understood without taking into account the human interventions. So we can really see that humans have basically created a new Earth sphere beyond the biosphere. Some call it the technosphere, the, the infrastructures, you know, the, the enormous uh, uh, structures, cities, uh, energy systems, traffic systems that humans have constructed. And, you know, we want to really understand this system. We have to not only take into account, you know, the traditional Earth spheres, you know, like the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the biosphere, but also this human technosphere. And that speaks very much for a real new understanding of Earth history as well. Yes, thank you so much to all three of you for taking the time today for the journalists to answer all their questions and to give us give us a short deep dive into the topic of the Anthropocene. Um, I would like to remind you again that the briefing and all the information that you also received are under embargo to next Tuesday, 11th of June, 7 p.m. Central European time. 
If you want to have a recording of the briefing or a transcript, please write us at uh, redaktion at sciencemediacenter.de. My colleague is posting the email address uh, in the chat. And you will find this email address also in the invitation email. Uh, we will provide the transcript as fast as possible. Um, yeah, thank you again all for joining, for your questions, and thank the three experts for taking the time. And I wish you a pleasant day or a pleasant evening, whatever's coming. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. You. Bye.